everyone. I'm Reggie Nance, Associate State Director for Multicultural Engagement with AARP New York. Welcome to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's 50th Annual Legislative Conference. AARP is pleased to sponsor today's issue session, Real Talk, Conversations about the Impact of Family Caregiving on the Black Community. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, mission-driven organization with nearly 38 million members with a focus on empowering everyone to live the best life possible at any age. We work to strengthen families and communities, and we advocate for the issues that matter most to the 50 plus. One such issue is family caregiving. Family caregivers are the backbone of the US care system, helping parents, spouses, and other loved ones live independently in their homes. Nearly eight in 10 family caregivers, 78%, incur out-of-pocket costs due to caregiving, and they spend on average $7,242 annually on care-related expenses, or 26% of their income on average. Hispanic, Latino, and Black family caregivers reported greater financial strain. This tremendous economic impact is the main reason that AARP is a strong proponent of the Credit for Caring Act, which would help working family caregivers offset the cost of some caregiving expenses. We have also have a dedicated website focused solely on caregiving and the needs of caregivers. Please feel free to visit aarp.org slash caregiving for more information. Now I would like for you to sit back, relax, and get ready for an engaging session that will be led by entertainer, comedian, television personality, philanthropist, and family caregiver herself, Cheryl Underwood. Cheryl is the owner and chief executive officer of Pack Rat Productions, a multimedia firm that is behind Cheryl Underwood Radio, where she is heard on almost 600 affiliates in the US and internationally. She is in her 12th season as the Emmy Award winning co host of CBS's Emmy Award winning daytime talk show, The Talk, viewed by an average of three plus million viewers each day and she is a five-time host of the Daytime Emmys. Cheryl is the 23rd international president of her beloved Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She holds four honorary doctorate degrees and is recognized as one of the most articulate, well-informed women of our time. She is also the founder of the Pack Rat Foundation for Education, which raises awareness and funds for HBCUs. You have seen her on stage. You have seen her on film and you see her daily in your living rooms. We are so thrilled you will get to see her today as she brings her wit, energy and hosting prowess as our moderator for this important and lively discussion on family caregiving. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the incomparable, the inimitable, Cheryl Underwood to the AARP stage. Take it away, Cheryl. Well, thank you, Reggie. As a matter of fact, I'm going to offer you a job to go on tour with me when COVID is over to be my MC because that was not just a kind introduction, but very energetic. And also, I'd like to thank AARP for your ongoing education efforts and advocacy on behalf of our nation's 48 million family caregivers. Every year, they provide about uh, $470 billion in unpaid care for their loved ones who are aging or living with disabilities. These caregivers help ensure that they can continue to stay in their homes and communities. And family caregivers represent every demographic as Reggie stated earlier, and their stories are unique. Their cultural traditions often influence our caregiving experience and the caregiving journey of Black people is often framed by cultural expectations to care for one's elders in community. 
However, with existing structural inequities and lack of access to quality services and supports, these expectations can come at a cost to their financial and health well-being. And I will say this, I think while we're understanding inequities, we also need to understand that this expectation could come as a cost and a cost to the well-being of the family of the caregiver. So it's when one serves, the entire family is serving as the caregiver. So today we're going to have some real talk on this issue. And we're also going to hold that thought because you know I'm on a computer. I'm a great comedian, but I'm a decent computer person. We're going to talk about some this significant impact on the community. And we want y'all to walk away with some pearls. I see one of our um, uh, panelists are wearing some, but we're going to give you some pearls of wisdom. And I want to tell you what those pearls are. Uh, our goals for this conversation are that we want to raise awareness of this issue. We want to delve into it in a way that we as a community don't often feel comfortable doing. Uh, we want to normalize, uh, and this is our second goal, normalize talking about all aspects of caregiving and the caregiving experience in an effort to help people know they're not alone and it's okay to ask for help. Uh, we also want people to share potential solutions and tools and resources to assist family caregivers with some of their emotional, financial, and social needs. Now, uh, I myself uh, am a caregiver. Most of you uh, who know me um, and watch me on TV, you know my story. Uh, is over a, a 25 year caregiver, and I'm always interested in gaining additional knowledge uh, that can be used to assist my own situation. So are we ready to learn more? Because I know I surely am ready to learn more as we welcome our panelists. Okay, let me make sure. Let's see. Uh, let's welcome our first panelist, Rita Chula, uh, the Director of Caregiving in the AARP Public Policy Institute. Welcome, Rita. Thank you. Melanie Campbell, the president and CEO of the National Coalition for Black Civic Participation and convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Dr. Romeo Stockett, a member of the Health and Wellness Committee for 100 Black Men of America Incorporated. Also, he's a brother of Omega Sci-Fi. And I think, uh, Melanie, aren't you a sister of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated? Thank Absolutely. You. And, and Dr. Stockard, uh, you, you both have a love for each other. Dr. Stockard, as a member of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> Let us welcome Aisha Atkins, constituency organizer for Caring Across Generations. And let us also welcome Lakeisha Foster Stickney, the Policy and Outreach Director for the House Democratic Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives. Welcome to our panel. And we, we really have uh, a wealth of knowledge here that I think everybody can uh, uh, benefit uh, from. So let's see, what is my next task here? Because I, um, you know, I'm on a talk show on TV, but you know, when you're working with AARP and the Congressional Black Caucus, you gotta have yourself in order. I, and yes, I am a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated and the 23rd International president, but I'm wearing red for AARP. Let's get to our first question. Uh, first question is, let's see, how about we, how about we flip it just a little bit? And, uh, and I know that a few of you have your own caregiving story. So let's take a minute or two to briefly share your journey. Let's see, where should I start? Let's see, where would you like to start uh, Rita, no, Rita, yes. Rita, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, Cheryl, and thanks for your wonderful introduction. Um, I entered into uh, my, or on my caregiving journey almost 20 years ago um, as I was caring for my grandmother, and shortly after she passed, um, my mother uh, began to exhibit um, really troubling symptoms, and we spent a number of years um, trying to figure out what was going on, and eventually, uh, through misdiagnosis and then 
um, an actual diagnosis, she was um, found to have frontal temporal dementia, which, you know, many people know about Alzheimer's, but they don't know about the other related dementias and frontal temporal is one of those. Um, so from that point, to about 12 years later, her passing, unfortunately, last October, um, my family and I really struggled to support and care for her. Um, of course, it was a labor of love for us, but the journey um, was made difficult by many of the things that we will be discussing today. And I think one of the important pieces, and I'm so grateful that you mentioned that earlier, is that that journey was not just mine as the primary caregiver. I'm the mother to two wonderful young children who are six and eight and who were born into this situation, um, as well as the wife of a wonderful husband. And this journey has been all, all of ours. Um, and, you know, again, the challenges that came with it, uh, we will continue to discuss, but there were many joys as well. We want to impart that health is always there, but it's the family that comes together, it's the community that comes together, and it's not without its challenges, even though it's a duty and a noble duty uh, to care for someone, it's not without its challenges. Let's uh, go to Melanie. Would you like to share your journey? Uh, thank you, Cheryl. And thank you, ARP, for this invitation to all of my panel colleagues. Um, for me, I have not had that uh, experience when it comes to my parents, uh, but I have had it when it comes to siblings, uh, not long-term, but I had a sister uh, back in 2011 who uh, became really, really ill, passed away. Um, actually had two sisters within 30 days pass away, but one who we had to um, show up and be present um, in, in the situation in the hospital. And there's a lot of what I learned so much uh, in going through that with my sister Ruby was learning about uh, hospice care and the things that the, the, and the uh, challenges that it pulls with family decisions that you have to make, uh, uh, end of life decisions. And so uh, it changed my, my perspective and I had to grow up pretty fast because I'm the baby of the family, the youngest of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had to help my mother and uh, others make some really, really hard decisions. Um, and, and I think that's part of the, the, the challenge of being able to deal with the, with the, 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 the the decisions that you have to make yeah. uh, that you never thought you'd, you'd come uh, to face, but we all have to face them. So that's been one of the things and more recently with my brother uh, who had some uh, challenges and you you have to make real hard decisions and yeah. had to help him through some challenges. He's still going through, uh, but with our family, uh, just being able to know that as, a, as a, 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 a one of the children who didn't have children uh, mm -hmm. and it's, and as a sibling, uh, the responsibilities that, that we have to be there for each other. So it, so those two are two of my personal experiences. Absolutely, I think that's something that you and I share, that um, I'm in the middle, you were the, the youngest, and then uh, dealing with uh, caregiving for uh, a sibling, you know, and to make those types of uh, decisions. Um, and I thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Dr. Stockett. Oh yes, when I when I just uh, uh, as a part of our discussions with AARP, the 100 uh, leadership in the health and wellness, when I realized that this was going to be the topic, I actually jumped at the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. My experience is twofold: one, professionally, uh, as I owned a uh, hospice home hospice practice for a number of years, where in the practice, of course, we went from uh, uh, bedside to benevolence as far as developing programs, projects, and connecting families to resources as they uh, prepare to be, be a uh, caregiver and during the process. And then, of course, after should that happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, to, to one of the points that we were discussing before, many folks uh, do not necessarily die in hospice care. Some of them show signs of recovery and, 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 and are taken off hospice. So there's a lot of dynamics that, that are happening from, in, in that area. One thing that uh, we, we're gonna to discuss tonight and one thing that the two of you have pointed out 
already is the is the dynamic between the family and who does what and where and the decisions. So uh, I welcome the opportunity to uh, to uh, to contribute on the part of the uh, resources and the uh, services of hospice, but I've also been a caregiver uh, for the last few years of my mother's life, uh, and several other uh, relatives, and uh, on the point of the role of men as caregivers and men as uh, single dads, I've also been a single parent for a number of years. And so it, those dynamics uh, all come together um, to, uh, to, to enhance uh, our ability and willingness to, uh, to serve as caregivers. But uh, so I welcome the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Thank you. And, and, uh, and Dr. Saka, uh, you know, we have programs uh, like in Zeta Phi Beta, we have a, a program, Elder Care. And I, I think this would be a great uh, discussion to be had within our fraternities and sororities as some people will become a caregiver very, very young, or they're not just caregiving for a sibling, they may be caregiving for a parent of some sort, or maybe even a member of the organization who really does not have a lot of family and yeah. that that bond is dependent upon someone saying, I know you need me and I'm there when you need me. So I would love to see you consider to partner with the nine black Greek letter organizations so we can extend this discussion. And it might be great for AARP and the Congressional Black Caucus to do this as a process that it goes through other organizations as well, because I think this would be very beneficial. Uh, let's go to absolutely. I think I think it'd be a, a global situation, especially in our organization, our chapter states and regions. Um, let's go to uh, Lakeisha. Would you like to share your story? Hi. Uh, so uh, thank you, ARP, for having me. And so what I'll say is, at this point in my life, I am not yet have not yet had the, been a primary caregiver, but as you noted, Cheryl, and, and read you as well, that when one serve, we all serve. And so I've had to, had to, I've had to support, you know, my grandmother who cared for her mother of well until her early nineties, who had a severe case of rheumatoid arthritis, who she was on crutches all her life and from crutches to wheelchair to the mm -hmm. point where she had to have some of her limbs amputated. And, 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 and so I was able to see kind of not only was it a labor of a love for my grandmother and for us as well who supported her, but it was also, uh, it, it came with its own set of, of emotional and mental challenges. So much so that, you know, my great grandmother, you know, um, bless her heart and God rest her soul. She instructed my, you know, before she passed through, before three to four months before she passed, she instructed my grandmother to call the ambulance have her transported to the hospital so that she could check herself into our nursing facility so that she would no longer um, be that, provide that level of stress and, and burden on the, the family unit and caring and, and caring and caring for her. And so, you know, we begrudgingly honored her wishes. Um, but it was, it was, it was, it was, it was frustrating and hurtful just to and hurtful to, 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 to not be able, it, it was just to see someone who was trying to be as independent as they wanted to, and then having to, to care for them the way that we had to end up caring for her. And she felt that she became a burden to where she felt the need to have, um, to go and, 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 and live her last days into, um, into a nursing facility so that to relieve some of the pressure on my grandmother and, and you know, and, 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 and the family. And so as a result of that, just two weeks ago, I started having a conversation with my grandmother to say, you know, what do, what are your wishes? How, how should we handle this when it's time? If that, if that time ever comes, hope preferably not, but if it does, let's go ahead and have the conversation now about how we address this issue in a way that is beneficial for all of us. Absolutely, and, and I will tell you, I went through the same thing. My sister was living with me. I had planned that we were going to live together. Uh, if anything happened to my mother, who was our primary uh, caregiver, uh, that she was going to live with me. And uh, when it came time that she had to go into a nursing home, uh, it, it, it did and still does affect my um, mental health 
and we're going to talk about mental health issues um, because we feel, okay, no, you were supposed to be, you, I have a line in my show where the big mama gets sick, big mama's in a hospital bed in the living room because we want to see big mama every day. And there's a relative that's a certified nursing assistant, but she believes she's an LVN, RN, but she go take care of big mama. And that's the way we were raised. But there are services that we have to understand that, that uh, are, are better suited. But there are a lot of people that don't even know these services are afforded to them or exist. And that's why today is a very important day. And uh, we pray your strength and pray the strength of all who are affected with this type of situation. Uh, let's go to Aisha. Because uh, when I talked about being a young woman, a caregiving, let's go to Aisha and want to hear your story. Thank you so much, Ms. Underwood. Uh, it's a, certainly a pleasure and an honor to be in conversation with each of you uh, this afternoon. I became a caregiver in 2013 when, uh, like Rita, my mother was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia, which is the leading form of dementia for folks under the age of 60. And it was certainly something that I was unprepared uh, to take on, but also willing to take on uh, because I love my parents and I've seen care in the way that it's shown up over the course of uh, my life and my parents provided care to me. I was born three months prematurely, weighed a pound and a half at birth, had significant health challenges and uh, you know, saw both of my parents experience various health issues mm -hmm. throughout the course of my foundational years, mm -hmm. which certainly had an impact on me in the way that I viewed and observed care. However, when I became a caregiver, there were just so many things that I did not know. Uh, there was a feeling of inadequacy in terms of being prepared, being knowledgeable about end of life issues and other, other things that we tend to shy away from discussing, particularly in the black community, things that are taboo. And I really just saw a lack of support and a lack of access to formal supports like home and community-based services, which really led me into the work that I do professionally as a constituency organizer for caring across generations. My lived experience became my professional passion because I really observed where uh, voices of black and brown folks were not being represented in policy. Uh, in addition, I really, I understood that more and more millennial caregivers with our baby boomer parents aging were going to become uh, caregiver or millennials were going to become caregivers and tremendously needed not only policy change, but also uh, tangible support and, and safe spaces to express themselves with others who shared that experience in a unique way. So I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation. Absolutely. From one preemie to another, you know, we're little, but we, you know, we came to earth to do what we needed to do. And uh, I, I, I look forward to the discussion of uh, uh, not just uh, uh, systemic circumstances, precluding us uh, to uh, gaining access to resources. I think I said that diplomatically, but also the fact that some people will say, well, somebody else will do it. Well, sometimes there is no one else uh, to do it, or I don't have what you have, or I don't want to, or you know, people have to understand that there are services out there, um, that uh, these conversations are very, very necessary. And the, and the pre-planning, is necessary. The forward vision is very, very necessary, but also the fight for access to these services because there are others who get the services and then when you come to get them, I can't be affording them. So uh, let's get to some of our questions. Uh, let's start with Rita. You know, we noted that there are many challenges that come with family caregiving. Uh, Rita, can you please give us more insight into what some of those challenges might be? Absolutely, Cheryl. And, you know, we've talked through many of them just listening through or to the stories um, of, of my fellow panelists, but there are a few that I want to highlight. And I think it really starts with the importance, as you've noted several times, of having this conversation in Black communities. I think that there's an assumption that 
um, when you're in a Black family, that we take care of each other, um, no matter what. Um, and while that may be true, uh, there is oftentimes that leaves not an opening for the discussion. Uh, we don't like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about what will happen as we age. <clears throat> and as such, when crises occur or um, the reality becomes present, we don't know what to do and we don't know how to ask for help. On the other side, as Aisha spoke about, there are services, but too often those services are not targeted to the Black community. Too often uh, due to structural inequities and racism in our communities, those services um, may not be, the quality is not as high, the access to quality services isn't high, so we have to go outside of community, um, which then leads us to say, well, we'll just do it ourselves. Um, I think it's really important. We hear this uh, phrase all the time to caregivers: uh, "If you know, make sure to put your oxygen mask on first. Right. But within the Black community and many other uh, communities, it's very difficult. And what good does an oxygen mask do if it has holes in it? Holes that are created by the systems that surround us. And so we at ARP and other organizations are really working to change that. I think the out-of-pocket costs that uh, Reggie talked about uh, is a huge issue um, within our community and others. There's this expectation that family caregivers are responsible for everything. Well, as a family caregiver myself, it's impossible to be responsible for everything. You're just not able to fully support the needs of an older adult or someone with a disability while at the same time trying to work a full-time job, while at at the same time caring for two, one, two, or three um, young children. And so it becomes extremely important that there are supports within the community. Um, we know that 60% of family caregivers work so our employers, um, it's, it's very important that employers support family caregivers. Um, and then just across the board with both in public and private sector that family caregivers are given the opportunity to do what they really want to do, but they need access to those resources and they need that support. And then my final point really is around the healthcare system. Healthcare providers, all too often, it's a mystery how to interact. They do not communicate with family caregivers. Um, all too often, family caregivers are left spinning, um, trying to have the conversation, trying to understand how to better care. Um, very often, uh, healthcare providers uh, give family caregivers highly complex tasks to do at home and they have no idea how to do that. And so to that last point, it's very crucial that healthcare providers also understand um, who family caregivers are and what their needs are and meet them, um, at least meet them where they are. Absolutely, absolutely. And speaking to that, we would hope that people would understand, uh, and this question is to you, Melanie, that typically the caregiving responsibility falls to Black women. In fact, 66% of Black caregivers are women. So, um, Melanie, could you speak to, especially with hearing what, what Sister Rita has just said, yes. um, the issues that Black women caregivers in particular face? Uh, uh, thank you. I was just listening to Rita and going, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And I hear that so much. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about the fact that Black women are, we are the primary heads of household. And we also many times are the ones who have to uh, step up. Of course, as our brother, brother Romeo says, brothers do it too. Uh, my brother helped take care of my mother for 20 plus years uh, before she passed. So that is a fact. Um, but, uh, you know, but as Black women, we, we tend to also have a challenge when it comes to uh, income. And so when we're, I always tell people, my paycheck, girl, is not my paycheck mm -hmm. um, because I've got to help make sure. So there's all kinds of also uh, intangible things that you don't see as quote unquote caregiving, but they are, right? To make sure that the families, uh, folks in the family uh, are able to be whole, uh, at least the basics of being able to survive um, uh, economic challenges. And so as black women, as being uh, the responsibility of caregiving also means that we may not uh, achieve all the things that we may want to do. Um, folks may have to step away from their education or 
uh, not go after that next higher paying uh, job. And see, as Black women, we also retire with so much less average income of uh, 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 wealth for Black women, hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a crisis in the family, and we don't know about the resources uh, or don't have access to them, um, and knowledge is power. And so I love this conversation uh, because. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, just being able to know, um, have the information is what is critically needed uh, in our community. But Black women balancing, if you, and if you're in the sandwich generation where you taking care of your parents and you're taking care of your, your, your children, all these things have a really adverse impact on Black women's ability to, uh, to actually retire with income, with, with, with the kind of wealth that's needed to survive retirement and not end up poor in retirement. And that happens too often in our community. So, um, so, so yeah, we have challenges, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the kind of conversation we're having here, Cheryl, Cheryl, when you, Cheryl, when you talked about what our organizations can do, uh, which is why for, for our organization, this is a really critical conversation that has to be multi-generational because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just happen down the road. It can happen in a blink of an eye and you find yourself and not knowing what to do. So, so yeah, we, information is power. So thank well, you. And I'm sure you're going to go to your members of Delta Sigma Theta and all sororities. Let's come together and talk about this. We have to plan for it. Uh, and we have to plan for it early because you just never know what's going to happen. You may be the person or you may be the caregiver. And when you're talking about things that you need, lawyers, you know, sometimes you have to fight for some of these services. And, and then they, I will say this, and, and, and if, I'm, if I'm out of pocket, I'm sure someone will let me know. Sometimes it make you feel as a black person, you're not supposed to have any of this. You're not supposed to know this, or you just make do with what you have. And then when you find out that there were by law services you were supposed to get, but because of discrimination, uh, because of uh, racism, because of uh, uh, the fact that people don't want you to have inequity. You want, don't want you to have the equal parts that you should have as a citizen of this country. And then when you find out late that this could have been afforded to you, it's so disappointing. It's, 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 it's just a hard feeling. If I wasn't in the career that I'm in, I don't think that I would have the services that I have. So that's why I want to be a part of this discussion because we all have to bring our resources to make sure that everyone who is a caregiver can get the resources that they need. Dr. Stockett, Stockett uh, Melly just shared her insights on black women as caregivers, but what is less known is that men are increasingly providing care. And there's, there's a couple of questions here and I'm, I'm gonna kind of go off script just a little bit if you could tell us about the experience of black male caregivers, but also I was, I was widowed in my twenties. I knew I was going to take care of my sister and, and with dating. And, and if you marry a man who's taking care of a family member, or if a man is going to marry me and my duty is to be a caregiver, can you speak to that Dr. Stock? A single parent. Yes. And uh, one thing that I am proud to say nationally and for all men, but for black men in particular, we have become very evolved uh, over the years. And especially over the, the last 20 or 30 years where uh, the social numbers have pushed us to it. We have more divorces, we have more uh, black male uh, uh, single parent. And one thing when, when I was in the, in the hospice business, regardless of the family that was there and present and uh, positioned to care for the client, I always pressed for where are the men here and invited them or insisted on their participation mm -hmm. in, in the process. And when you were talking about accessing care, you know, yeah. uh, policy drives all of the inequities, okay? It's, it's not even the, the clinical practices or whatever, it's the policies. And they actually had policies in place that almost prohibit men from accessing services for uh, 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 for a care that they were providing 
home care for simply right. because of either income, availability, uh, status, or what have you. So in every regard that we address issues of the caregiver, please focus on how can you Im impact the policy that affects the opportunity for access. And what I wanna encourage everyone to do when you talk about support for a caregiver, mm -hmm. they need liaison. They should have yeah. someone, someone that will speak for them. It could be at their church, it could be at a local, it could be through the fraternity, sorority. They are gonna be busy and engaged enough, okay? But they still have the voice and they have to be able to access those care, uh, those, uh, those support services. So your churches, uh, your fraternity, sororities have incredible programs to support. But one of the largest and toughest thing is not to speak of female, but accessing transportation, uh, 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 access with hours if you're working, and all of those things have to be addressed and and in order to uh, to enhance the the service, uh, the opportunity to be a caregiver. But one other point that I want to make is so important is the family dynamics are so cr critical when it comes down to who does what. And that's when you recognize that, you know, you got to honor folks' capacity. You know, some folks that's flat can't do it. Someone who has been doing or leading up to it for a number of years, when they're put in that position now for it to happen, they just crash and burn. So you don't want those kinds of issues to actually disrupt or destroy the family. But you got to be prepared for that as you uh, get closer and closer to your involvement. And that's what we did in many of the uh, hospice families to prepare them and know and understand as we go toward the opportunity uh, to be a caregiver. And this is what these programs like this and uh, AARP and these awareness programs and uh, these community Acts, uh, community service access programs really do to enhance the ability of the parent. But the, everything else as far as men and women at this point, it's pretty much equal uh, mm -hmm. as far as knowing and understanding the responsibility, in many cases, stepping up. And I know of many of estranged, if you were, fathers or brothers, whom came home for the sole purpose of either being a caretaker or being a part of the care. So you got to entertain those discussions well in advance. So planning is important. Uh, look at the policies that cause uh, the inequities and address them and address them hard because they are all local. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, I had mentioned earlier that I became a caregiver uh, early in my life. I was I was uh, in my uh, late twenties, early thirties, and Aisha. We often think that a family caregiver is someone over fifty, when in fact, uh, fifty three percent of Black caregivers are between the age of uh, eighteen and forty nine. So, as a millennial caregiver who has been caring for both parents for quite some time, can you talk to us about your experience as a younger caregiver and some of your needs? Certainly. Yes, I think that being a younger adult caregiver certainly comes with unique challenges. Primarily, first of all, education around uh, issues like Medicare and, you know, understanding power of attorney and all of this terminology that, again, we don't discuss very often in the Black community. And these are things that are critically important to making sure that the person you are caring for gets access to the services they need, as well as uh, quality of care that they deserve. And so a lack of understanding and literacy around these issues uh, can, can make it certainly difficult. Uh, additionally, uh, oftentimes, if you are a younger adult yourself, that means that your parent may be younger and may not be, if, for instance, in my mother's case, she was diagnosed at the age of 57. So she was not eligible for Medicare. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, you know, those out-of-pocket expenses that have been mentioned uh, were crushing really to our family. Uh, my father continued to work full-time. I'm an only child. So I stepped into that role of, of, of caregiver. Uh, 
So that's certainly a, a, a challenge that many young adult caregivers face. Uh, and then additionally, uh, the caregiver themselves faces, uh, they face challenges around uh, their own futures and their own uh, financial security, social security, because uh, for many, they've had to either um, delay or interrupt their education. Uh, there may be gaps in their resume. We already know that, um, you know, the Black folks face hiring discrimination. And so, you know, any excuse like those gaps in resumes uh, not to hire you, you know, it, it certainly uh, can, can be an impact. Uh, additionally, you know, your own um, family planning, uh, the ability to, uh, you know, we plan kind of around the, the nuclear family structure. Uh, if you, uh, and, and many people certainly choose not to marry and that's great. However, you know, as I age and I, I look at our, our lack of services, our lack of, of community supports and just the way that communities have changed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, my father told, tells stories of, you know, when he went up to check on his grandmother, they would check on me mm -hmm. as well. Uh, you know, older women who, who did not marry and there is a sense of responsibility and community. They've been in these communities for generations. That's not as much the case now. People are, are for more transient and move around. Um, and you just don't have that same sense of community responsibility that perhaps you have had in the past. Uh, so therefore, you do have uh, a greater dependence on uh, these of the policies that create these services, uh, as well as the funding. Uh, and then lastly, you, the, if there are interruptions in your career, uh, you oftentimes don't have savings, as uh, Rita alluded to earlier, you don't have savings, and we often don't have access to generational wealth. And so, you know, as I age, I just started a savings account uh, this year. And uh, that's something that as, you know, I near 40, I certainly give thought to about my own health, my own security, um, and, and what my future looks like. And, and uh, I'm glad that you're saying this because I think most people just don't see, even with AARP, they don't think that, they think AARP is for people in their 50s, you know, and they don't understand that you can become part of AARP in your 30s. And had I known that in my 30s and had I understood that in my 30s, I'm sure I would be uh, uh, more participatory uh, earlier. Uh, I'm going to call it audible. Was it Omaha? I'm gonna call it Audible real fast. Before we get to Lakeisha, uh, Melanie, uh, I know you have uh, another destination to impart your wisdom, but uh, can you give us uh, some some thoughts uh, before you have to uh, uh, go to your next situation? And then we're gonna to go to Lakeisha about legislative uh, uh, call to action. So, Melanie, first, you can you speak? Uh, thank to you, us? Cheryl. Again, thank you, ARP, for the invitation. And apologize, I had two things happen at the same time. Right? That's all right. Um, but uh, one of the things that 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 uh, as Black women we have to allow ourselves to be and not to be superwoman, uh, mm -hmm. not to be superwomen. We can be super without uh, all the burdens of being superwoman, mm -hmm. um, and 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 understand that it's okay to talk about these things, share, uh, and understand that the 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 kinds of stresses and strains that uh, it's kind of the um, say we have to take care of ourselves and it's okay to be able to share that you have having challenges, right? It's a part of, uh, sometimes you, you feel um, as uh, the person who is, as this, most, most of us are heads of household. So that, that, that comes with the, some element of that responsibility, but it's really important that we do that. And then if there's some, something very tangible that's going on uh, when it comes to uh, the kinds of things that are needed to be in place to help uh, not just Black women, but for for um, for all of us. And that's uh, pushing for uh, federal paid family leave right. and how important that is and how yes. it will have an impact on uh, being able to address okay. some of these issues that we are discussing today, mm -hmm. because in many cases, because you don't have that. Uh, and to be able to talk to the employer about right. one thing COVID has done, COVID, we hadn't we talked about the issue of COVID-19 right. and mm -hmm. as a survivor of it, and, uh, mm -hmm. of it myself, being able to understand that if ever there was a time to understand there's a need for something universal like that, uh, that crosses all generations and backgrounds, 
it's uh, the issue around paid families. I want to throw that out there as something that we need to all speak up about. Um, and just let's assist us. We can be super, but we don't have to be super women. Absolutely. And because it has an impact on your mental health as well. You exactly. know, and, and I'm glad that you brought that up. And, you know, we are our sisters and brothers keeper. You know, we have to stay strong, but sometimes we can say, hey, you need some help or let me take over or let me do this. But I, I love the fact that you're talking about paid family leave. You're talking about the impact of COVID. For most people, if you are a service uh, provider, even in your employment, you don't get to work from home. So you don't, you don't get that. You have to go out and do that work. But Lakeisha, I want to ask you, what... Uh, what uh, it should be a part of our call to action. Uh, how can constituents encourage their representatives in Congress to focus more on issues around family caregiving? What do we do? What, what, is, the, what is the charge? Give us a charge. Uh, well, first of all, I know Melanie just had to jump off, but just I just want to thank her for that word. Although, you know, as 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 a as a as a as a, as a mother of a, uh, of a working mother of a young black son. Yeah. Uh, it, that that is, 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 is reassuring to hear and comforting to hear those words. <clears throat> but there are a lot of um, uh, issues that were that were raised that quite quite frankly are at the forefront of our legislative agenda. You know, thankfully, the systemic inequities, the mm-hmm. access, the lack of access to, to, to quality care and quality services, the disproportionate um, um, the, how black women, black and brown women disproportionately make up paid and unpaid their, in terms of pay, being paid and unpaid, you know, caregiving, paid family leave. So in, in Congress, thankfully, you know, the, unfortunately it took the pandemic to, to center these issues. These issues of, and conversations have always been around and, and been raised by a mighty few, but now they have been, been elevated at, to the center of, of House Democrats' agenda, President Biden's agenda, um, and his, his Build Back Better agenda, so much so that we're trying to, to um, address these issues issues more holistically instead of mm-hmm. more fragmented. You know, the credit for care that AARP uh, is, 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 is pushing is key to, as she said, to helping, to helping those families as, as, they're, as they're caring for their families, but also trying to transition into hopefully getting access to the service like health, uh, the home and community-based services that Aisha, Aisha mentioned. And the paid family leave is also an important component. And those things are all part of the agenda. Uh, and hopefully we're able to do something on these issues in the next, next couple of months. But what, and, but what we need from, from, from constituents, what we need from folks are a couple of things. One is to get engaged. And the first way to get engaged I'm gonna make, is to vote. Because if you do not vote and be a part of this process, then we are unable to elect representatives who share our values. We're unable to elect hey, representatives God. who look like us, who hey, can God. share the experiences and the perspective, who can, sh- and who can influence these policies um, that we have been excluded from from, from so long. So you know, vote and engage to engage in the process, show up at events your members of your member of Congress has, their town halls, any of it, and raise this issue and share your story. Sharing your personal story is the best testimony that you can give to help influence policy. And so don't be afraid to share to, to share that. And uh, to share that with with your with your elected official, mm-hmm. the third thing, honestly, is just to you to be, start building momentum and join coalitions. AARP, mm-hmm. you know, wonderful organizations. They also are, also have uh, groups and coalitions that they are a part of. In order to continue to build momentum and keep this as a part of the conversation, you know, even after I'm gonna claim it, even after we 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 address this legislatively you know, in the next couple of months, it can't be a one and done type of thing. And so could be, be, become build coalitions, become part of coalitions uh, to continue to put the pressure on, on members of Congress and even your local and state elected officials as well uh, to make sure that, the, that these issues are, are a part of their conversation and remain a conversation. I just wanna leave you with this. We, the, the, we are at a time where we have an opportunity to make some really, big, huge transformational changes legis- uh, uh, legislatively. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I encourage us all to seize, to seize this moment um, and engage in, in, in every way that they can, 
but I'm just gonna go back to how I open and that is to vote because these issues will always remain. We'll always be able to address these issues if we vote and make sure that people, the people that represent us, you know, mm-hmm. share, share our values. Absolutely, absolutely. And vote on all levels. It's not just uh, for the presidency. You have to vote on your local level, your state assembly, because you, you have a state impact there. You have the federal impact there. And if you know that we just saved the democracy by exercising our right to vote, that's why some people don't want us to vote. And they want to put forth legislation that will restrict our ability to vote. Then there's a lot at stake. You have to vote like your life depends on it because it does. Let me think all of our wonderful panelists for their honesty, the rich dialogue that we've just shared and sharing their experiences and expertise. Family caregiving is an issue worthy of discussion. I appreciate their commitment and dedication to helping address the needs of family caregivers. Many of us uh, will fall into this role at some point of our lives and I hope today's conversation provided you with important information that can be helpful. And if you're ever faced with navigating how best to care for an aging or disabled loved one, remember, you are not alone. It's a great song by Michael Jackson. Just remember that song, You Are Not Alone. There are many organizations like AARP, the Black Women's Roundtable, 100 Black Men, uh, Black Greek Letter Organizations, your churches, everything that's happening in your community, and caring across generations that are advocating for policy solutions and creating resources for family caregivers. Uh, For more information about the great work that these organizations and many, many more who need to join this noble cause uh, can do, please visit their respective uh, websites. And uh, again, we're going to have to do this again because there's more discussion uh, to be had. Don't you all agree? We're going to need to do this again. And as we get ready, and and these are my words, not the words of AARP, get ready for the midterm. Get ready for the midterm. Get ready for the midterm. And thank you, AARP, for allowing me to uh, um, preside. So thank you, Cheryl Underwood, and to all of our panelists for their very enlightening, provocative, and informing, informative conversation about family caregiving. caregiving. And Cheryl, we certainly hope you will come back again as we continue these types of conversation with much needed information. If you'd like to learn more about AARP's caregiving initiatives or about anything else that you've heard here tonight or to check out some of the resources that are available to you from AARP, once again, you can go to aarp.org slash caregiving. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone.